there's a lot of talk at the moment about open AI. Uh, and actually, I asked Dali to generate me, um, I think the, the, it was nature, uh, for technology embracing nature, and the Dali AI actually generated this, uh, this graphic for me, which I thought was quite funny. And obviously, a lot of people are talking about open AI at the moment. So um, why, why not start a talk with open AI? And actually, my closing slide is, is also another open AI thing. So anyway, so my, my journey around sustainability, what, what, why am I talking to you about this here today? Uh, I've always been sort of curious about science. I've always been sort of passionate about, about nature and, uh, and environment. And it was kind of a toss-up for me between doing science, uh, doing a science-based career and doing a technology career. And I ended up doing a computer science degree. Uh, I then ended up doing sort of a couple of graduate jobs in the city as a programmer. But then I managed to stumble upon working for an energy and climate change consultancy for a number of years. And I actually really enjoyed that role. Uh, and it was only because of the financial crisis that I ended up moving from um, energy and climate change consulting into energy. I ended up working for a European uh, energy company in the energy trading um, side. Uh, but along the way, I'd done some work for European Commission, um, which was fascinating, kind of working at the member state level, EU member states, uh, but also for the Department of Energy and Climate Change in DEFRA. And so I learnt, learnt sort of some of the, I suppose, sustainability basics, some of the kind of carbon um, calculator type stuff. We were building some of the first carbon calculators in the UK in my team. It was great work. Um, but then since then, I've kind of moved into other roles in, 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 in uh, different sectors. And it's nice now at Scott Lodge to revisit this topic as we're really keen to kind of explore what sustainable technology means and what does sustainability, you know, what can sustainability be um, supported by you know, technology. So uh, last thing is on this is I also run a podcast called Architect Tomorrow and this topic's come up a few times. The reason I'm recording is um, the video will almost certainly appear, appear on there at some point as well. So Scott Logic, Rich has already sort of t talked to you about this so I won't, I won't spend too long. Um, we're a medium-sized technology consultancy, predominantly sort of software engineering and data engineering. We've been around since 2005. But before I talk about sustainable technology, I wanted to just quickly talk about what are sustainability commitments. So, what has Scott Logic decided to do in this space? What commitments have we made? We're actually we set out a plan to net zero, um, and we've we've started on that journey by understanding what our carbon footprint is. Not just our scope one, which is actually pretty small. The, the, for those of you who don't know what scope one, and two, and three is, scope one is our direct emissions, and the only real direct emissions we have in scope one is our Newcastle office has a gas um, heating system, so uh, the gas that we burn there uh, warming up Newcastle is scope one. The, the rest then is scope two, which is the emissions from our electricity usage and, and things like that. But the big chunk is actually scope three, so our supply chain, our laptops, our cloud services, our various other sort of um, things that we're consuming as a business the data centers and so on. So actually, you know, the, the vast majority of our carbon footprint sits in our scope three rather than our scope one or two. We've created some principles as well. So Graham Odds, our uh, chief strategy officer, is really passionate about um, not just doing sustainability in air quotes, but actually living and breathing this stuff. So being sustainable by design, trying to redesign ourselves so that we're thinking more sustainably and really thinking about abatement over neutralization. What does that mean? It means trying to reduce our emissions before neutralising them, before doing carbon offsetting, but clearly offsetting will have part, a part to play uh, in the mix. Continuing improvements, we're constantly looking for ways we can improve and being a force for good. And by that we mean not just thinking about the carbon uh, saving, but also what other improvements can we make to other sustainability measures along the way. I like these two pictures when it comes to thinking about sustainability. So the one on the left is my version of the three sort of those spheres. The impact of people, um, and society on the, on the top left, the environmental responsible kind of circles of planet. So people, planet, and some people call it profit, but I personally prefer economically viable because not every organization is about making a profit. Some, sometimes it's just about being economically viable rather than being overly fixated on growth and profit. And then the picture on the right is a great paper about carbon tunnel vision. So at the moment, we're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, CO2. But actually, as this sort of picture shows, if you overly fixate on carbon emissions, you forget about the various other things that actually are uh, intertwined with um, you know, environmental and, and, and the carbon sort of uh, topics. So a, a, a useful picture to sort of think more broadly about the topic. And I think, for me, triple bottom line businesses and sustainable businesses are just better run businesses that are going to be more profitable they're going to be places where people want to do business because they're more ethical and they do and they treat customers and their people better. So there's a number of reasons why this makes sense to me, not just because it's the right thing to do for the environment. So the sustainable development goals, I'll just get another show of hands, I'll keep this reasonably interactive until we get to Q&A. 
How many people have come across the UN Sustainable Development Goals before? Excellent, nice. So, and we'll come back to Sustainable Development Goals shortly. So sustainable technology then. I've been doing a fair amount of thinking about this, but the reason I wanted to talk to you all, and, and I'm really interested in the Q&A afterwards, is I don't have all the answers. I've pieced some of this together from my own research and, and looking at reports and looking at data. But I'm really interested in kind of getting a, you know, a more of a group view on some of this stuff. I'm going to put out some suggestions, some thoughts of my own, but absolutely please do um, do feedback as, as we kind of go through. So the first picture I've kind of created is this taking the sustainable topic when we think beyond just the sort of carbon aware sort of side of things. So a lot of things are being built as either carbon, carbon um, you know, they're measuring their carbon footprint or they're carbon aware. In other words, they're looking at when is the electricity grid dirtiest in terms of the fossil fuel mix, uh, in terms of the emissions mix, and they're looking to schedule their workloads when um, you know, electricity is cleaner. Now that's kind of you know, carbon aware. But as I said earlier, the carbon piece is only one part of the equation. So we can expand that out and think about green, so we can start thinking about what's the impact to air quality, what's the impact to um, you know, life on land and responsible consumption. You know, the the um, technology challenge when it comes to environment and sustainability isn't just energy consumption. Clearly that's a big part, but there's also a lot of you know, electronics manufactured, there's lots of servers built, there's lots of air conditioning units kind of created, there's, there's a whole kind of you know, set of other considerations when you're running a data center and there's networking and there's a whole host of other things that impact the natural world, which we'll touch on again in a minute. But broader than that is actually thinking ethically about the impact your systems have on the people that interface with them, the users, the maintainers, the stakeholders that are involved in those systems, thinking about how you're treating those people ethically. Thinking about a sustainable total cost of ownership. So I spent many years as an, as an enterprise architect in a sort of technology architect capacity where there's lots of thinking about cost of ownership, but actually if you think about it a little bit more broadly, you can bring the cost lever into play when it comes to some of the other angles on sustainability. Non-functional requirements and, and quality attributes. For me, this is about kind of looking at where we can layer in things and look for common sort of approaches that tick multiple boxes. So is there a way of making something more sustainable and more secure? Is there a way of making something more resilient, more robust, as well as thinking about how sustainable it is? Things around technical debt. Technical debt is a big thing that the enterprise architects, again, like to, and technology strategists like to think about how you deal with. But often there isn't an argument on its own to deal with a legacy system, an aging system that's perhaps consuming a lot of energy. But if you start to package this up in the round, you start to look for perhaps better business cases for doing some things here. Skills and supportability is a big one as well. Like how sustainable is the technology in terms of access to training, you know, to training uh, materials, to train staff, to people that can actually operate this, this, this platform? Uh, you know, and supportability. Is there a vendor um, con support contract available for this platform? You know, is that something that's expiring? Is that so we also need to plan to decommission? And decommissioning is a big one for me. I've worked in far too many companies where the uh, project implements a new system and you know, migrates maybe 80% of the workload off of the old system, but that last 20% is just too hard, so you just leave the legacy system running. Well, actually, that's just mad. So can we also use the sustainability agenda to say, no, that last 20% of workload, get it off that legacy system, get that legacy system switched off. And mature security and risk management. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of sort of risk uh, equations when it comes to technology and, and, and climate um, and, and being sort of holistic about thinking about security and thinking about risk management is really important here. So for me this is the broader picture and I think there's a lot more that could go into this circle and this is just the start really. I'd, I'd, I'd love for there to be more joined up thinking in this way and we'll revisit this when we come to Q&A. So back to those sustainable development goals then. Where do they map into technology? Where do I see them mapping into technology? And actually, even as late as 10 o'clock last night, I was getting feedback on this on LinkedIn, which is great. So there's some more SDGs on here than there were before. So um, clearly, there's a big energy consumption piece. We've touched, I've touched on that already. You know, kind of um, SDG 7 is all about affordable clean energy. It would be great if all of our technology was, was powered by clean energy. Unfortunately, that's not the reality today. In the UK, our grid mix is probably about 50% renewables uh, on average uh, uh, every year at the moment, which is which is better than some countries, but still, you know, a fair amount of improvement needed. Clearly, there's a linkage there to climate action, you know, um, ar around the energy consumption. Then there's the big materials piece I was talking about earlier. You know, the, the, the materials we need and the embodied carbon that those materials have. So a server or a laptop. You know, this laptop has 
you know, it requires energy, it requires materials to be mined, it, it has a footprint all of its own before it's even started consuming electricity. And its lifespan, you know, how often do you refresh hardware? Do you refresh hardware when users start complaining about its performance or are you just refreshing it every two, three years because that's just what everyone's always done? And this fast fashion for devices, particularly on the sort of consumer end, you know, the, these, are, these are really bad. You know, these seem to go out of date every couple of years and there's built-in obsolescence, right? I mean, why is it I can no longer replace the battery in this when a couple of generations ago I could replace my own battery? That just seems like a step backwards for me rather than a step forwards. So this kind of built-in obsolescence is a real challenge. This fast fashion for devices, lots of devices going to landfill, you know, e-waste to landfill, and the additional suggestions I had last night was actually waste metal runoff from landfill also then impacts water, so it impacts life in water. So this, this SDG 14 was added literally quite late yesterday. Life on land has an impact for e-waste to landfill, but also land users. You know, data centers, big cloud hyperscale um, data centers use a lot of you know land for, 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 for data centers. How do we minimize that and think about how that land impacts the, the ecosystem? And then there's also another one which someone made, made, out, made, made out to me, which is if you offset your carbon uh, from your energy usage, that potentially also has an impact on life on land. If there are land-based offsetting schemes, if there's reforestation or there's you know, other, uh, various, so, th so there can be sort of indirect consequences of your carbon offsetting, essentially. So I'm sure there's more, uh, there's more SDGs you could draw in, but these for me feel like the kind of core ones. The one I've not talked about is the sort of number nine, which is about industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And for me, this is all about if we come together as a technology community and we start to rethink some of this stuff and we think smarter about some of these things, are there some really clever ways we can actually pull, pull in the right direction as, a, as an industry? So, yeah, uh, the, the, the waste problem is a challenge. Um, and this, this was in here just to remind me to make sure I mentioned the kind of e-waste challenge, but it's, you know, it's a big problem. And I think a lot of people just don't think about it enough. Another model I came across during my research was the donut model. I don't know who's heard of donut economics. Okay, less people. Okay, so donut economics is really interesting, and there's a great TED talk on it. So I, and I'll probably do a bad job of explaining it, but I'll just give you the very quick high-level view. Essentially, the donut is the inner ring of the donut is how well are we doing socially. So what's our people kind of um, impact? You know, what's, the, what's our society kind of metrics look like? You know, inequality, education, things like that. We're often undershooting on that social foundation. The outer ring of the donut is about the planetary boundaries. So how much, um, you know, how much per year could we um, sustainably extract raw materials? How much per year could we emit carbon? You know, um, what's our carbon budget? Well, every year we're pretty much exceeding that planetary boundary. So what a group have done is take the donut model and then play it into technology. So there's this great website, doing the, uh, doingthedonut.tech. And the insight section is particularly interesting because it goes through like a workshop of how you could take the different dimensions of the donut model, which includes things like you know, climate change is a big one, but you've also got kind of land conversion, air pollution, various other things on the outside. But then you've kind of got the impacts to sort of equality, uh, peace and justice, income, education, health on the inside. And so what was really interesting is, and I do recommend going to the site, it sort of talks through how you can think about your project or your organization's technology on these different axes and start to think about some of this stuff. So um, well worth looking at that if you're looking at the bigger picture. The rest of the talk is probably going to flip more into the sort of green or carbon aware. So I, while starting with the grand vision of talking sustainability holistically, I am now going to do the thing that most people are doing right now and talk more about the energy and carbon side of things. Green software principles, another thing uh, I found during my research. Open source project, the Green Software Foundation, have created a bunch of really useful assets. It's all quite green and carbon focused, but it's a starting point. Um, and the green software principles, there's a few more than the three here, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into them a little bit in a minute. But essentially they're around energy efficiency, so consuming the least amount of electricity possible, um, hardware efficiency, so kind of the least amount of embodied carbon. I talked about that embodied carbon earlier. How do we reduce that, make the most out of our hardware? Carbon awareness, I talked about this right at the beginning. Can we do more with our systems? Can we tra train machine learning models, for example, when electricity is clean and, and not train them when electricity is actually constrained and we've got perhaps no wind blowing and no solar? Um, so those, those are the kind of three core principles for green software. I started to think about, actually, let's look at the security perspective of this as well. So if we have, uh, if we're consuming the least amount of electricity possible, we're perhaps looking for simpler solutions. A great tangible example of this might be WordPress. So WordPress is a, 
blogging platform that powers something around 30 to 100 million websites on the web, depending on what stats you look at. The challenge with WordPress is it's actually pretty inefficient. You've got a, a front end here, you've also got a database back end. Every time someone hits a WordPress site, unless it's cached, it's generally pulling <coughs> data out of a database and, and files from all over the server when it doesn't really need to. And most of these WordPress websites actually don't need to be as dynamic as WordPress allows them to be. You could move those to statically generated HTML, and you could save an awful lot of energy, and you'd also improve the security, because often, and definitely the case with WordPress, it's got you know, bugs and, and, and issues coming out of its ears every week. If you, if you place up something like Jekyll, which is a, a markdown-based static um, website, there's far less attack surface for that platform. Then about hardware efficiency as well, I'll go back to that legacy systems point. Not decommissioning those legacy systems, not only consume extra, extra electricity, they give hackers a, a, an additional attack service to get into your, into your environment. So some of these things kind of have great alignment. You know, thinking about how you're using your hardware infrastructure efficiently also can reduce other you know, challenges you have as a business. And the carbon awareness piece is really interesting for me. This speaks to, if you can make your system adaptable and, and more modular and um, more asynchronous, and by that I mean, can you make workloads kind of happen uh, you know, uh, out of sync with the end user? Can the end user request something and then that goes into a queue and that processing happens at the right time? Can you adopt some of those patterns? Because actually there's a whole bunch of other benefits that that brings you, like uh, adaptability, scalability, availability. You know, being able to shift your workloads from one cloud region or one cloud provider to another gives you a whole host of other benefits as well as thinking about the carbon intensity of the electricity it's consuming. So I think the more you start to think about some of these things, there are actually lots of other positive side effects. Don't get me wrong, there are also challenges as well. There are going to be some stakeholders that push back on doing less automated testing, for example. We'll come on to that in a second. So here's the kind of eight principles that the Green Software Foundation have come up with. I'm not going to go through all of them now because you can, you can, you can read through, through on, on the website. But what was interesting for me is I was, there's been a lot of discussion about efficiency. And there's a bit of a problem here, potentially. And that's something called the Jevons Paradox. So the Jevons Paradox basically says the cheaper you make something and the more efficient you make something, the more people consume it. The classic example of this is cloud. You know, we made compute really cheap. We made it, you know, low carbon, perhaps you know, greenwashing or non-greenwashing, you know, uh, the, the general um, consensus is that cloud, when done well, can be lower car carbon than, than running your own data center. The problem with that, of course, is that by making that available cheaply and more efficiently, people have spun up a lot more compute, a lot more technology than they would have done on-prem, because it's just been easier for them to do it, and it's been cheap for them to do it. So a lot of these things talk about efficiency, and when I've been talking about this internally, there's been a real pushback, actually, about, but doesn't efficiency just drive more consumption? So when we start to think about the efficiency pieces, I think it's kind of doing it because it feels like the right thing to do, but it may be a short-term fix, because people go right, go, right, great, we've brought our electricity bill down now, so now we've got more budget to build more platforms or run more systems. So it's an interesting kind of thing to have at the back of your mind, I think, when people talk about a lot of these things, because, yeah, efficiency doesn't necessarily always drive the outcome that perhaps we're looking for. So going back to that sort of broader sustainable shift, um, how could we move from perhaps green software principles, which I think are great, by the way, I think they're a really good, they're a really good starting point. But how can we sort of weave them in and start thinking about, you know, the users and stakeholders sort of things, um, thinking about um, skills, thinking about addressing technical debt and, and the legacy stuff I was talking about. And this for me is kind of, I think this is where the Holy Grail lives. So this is where, you know, and it's not, of course it won't be a silver bullet, but if you can create almost like the agile manifesto for sustainable technology that just sort of drives people to think or rethink what they're doing. Because I think at the moment there's, there's very little consideration given to this stuff. People just spin up tech. They don't think about it. They don't design for it. But um, starting to shift to these sustainable principles, I think, is the, right, is, the right, is the right starting point. Some more thinking here, and this is where I'd love to start kind of getting into more of an interactive session. We'll perhaps hold fire given we're recording. Um, I've started to kind of map out some of the areas of this, you know, everything from sort of systems design on the left, considering what you're doing before you start building, through to thinking about you know, engineering things and your DevOps kind of pipelines and so on being more efficient. Uh, thinking about how sustainable is your cloud computing or your infrastructure you're running stuff on, minimizing and optimizing infrastructure, you know, and, and, and generally sort of thinking about the trade-off that you have around quality and perhaps automated testing versus the energy usage that that's consuming. So, you know, where are there trade-offs to be made between running sort of automated tests every time you do a build, do a new system release, 
maybe that's the right thing to do from a QA perspective, but actually, you know, what is that consuming? Because many people I'm talking to now are saying that their non-production environment is actually consuming as much, if not more, in some cases, than their production environment, particularly when you start to look at AI, AI and ML. Because if you have lots of machine learning, lots of high-performance compute, um, and lots of modeling, that's consuming probably as much you know, energy and therefore creating as much carbon emissions as the runtime environment. So it's this trade-off, like how much should you optimize your code at, des at design time because that's the right thing to do because your production system will be far lower CO2 versus actually perhaps you know, minimizing this and then, max, you know, and then thinking about how you, you tweak it in production. So I think whilst it'd be great if there was all positive side effects from using less energy, you know, being more efficient, and managing your hardware life cycle refresh is better. It'd be great if there were just positive side effects. I think the reality is there is this isn't just a, you know, a simple equation. There are more things at play here. <coughs> Last few things before I throw open to discussion is I've kind of gone down a level deeper. And this is perhaps where I'll bring these slides back up and we'll have a conversation in a minute. Development, sort of systems engineering, what are the things we can think about? There's been a lot of talk on the internet about programming language selection. So if I choose C++, is it you know, more efficient as a, as a programming language than, say, Python uh, or PHP or something that's um, you know, interpreted, it's not compiled, it's, it's uh, you know, translated at runtime? The software de design patterns, I'm pretty confident the software design patterns do have a significant part to play here. If you're building a modular system that you can switch parts off or you can scale bits down to zero and scale them up according to demand, I'm pretty confident that feels like the right thing to do. Efficiency of the code written. Again, we get into the Jevons uh, paradox sort of challenge here. Is more efficient code just going to allow you to spin up more? The energy intensity of the development and developer platform. So is it better to give everyone laptops uh, because they're low, low, lower, um, you know, generally lower power? Uh, or is it bad because then they're plugging in external monitors? There's a whole bunch of sort of things around the developer environment in terms of hardware and software that you need to think about. The carbon intensity and elasticity of the development and non-production environment. By this, if I'm spinning up lots of different non-production environments every time I branch my code, I'm spinning up a new CI/CD pipeline, that's potentially consuming a lot of energy. So again, things to think about. It may be really nice to allow for a very big team to collaborate by having separate sort of development environments, but what's the trade-off? You know, what's the energy consumption as a result? Then we kind of move more into the sort of um, DevOps and deployment kind of thinking. So thinking about the CI, CD, so some of the things I was just touching on, the sort of build processes, um, thinking about your tool chain practices, thinking about, again, sort of carbon intensity of the, of, of the, of the DevOps platform, but frequency of deployment is another big thing. You know, a lot of people will say now, it, we can release several times a day. Brilliant. You know, but <laughs> at what cost? Uh, you know, and, and several times a day, actually too much. Do you need to be releasing several times a day? Yes, your customers might love that you can release features really, really quickly, but again, what's the impact? There's probably an awful lot of automated testing that that's having to kick off. And if you're doing that several times a day, that's you know, spinning up additional compute. So the automated testing robustness is a real interesting question. Like how much do we uh, and how intensely do we you know, test things? And then the networking piece, I think, is, is, is something that perhaps people are overlooking. If I shift my workload somewhere because it's less carbon intensive, what's the additional networking traffic that's now happening as a result of that shift? So I think. I haven't done the research yet to sort of look at that, look if that's significant or marginal, but if anyone has thoughts on that, um, be really keen to sort of hear from that in a minute. And then finally, the sort of infrastructure, the, the production environment, the cloud environments typically. You know, and this, by the way, up the, the box is top right, I've not been mentioning, which is also the user behavior or the stakeholder behavior in each uh, instance. So how your end users behave might undermine any optimizations you make. If someone's just clicking refresh all the time because your user interface and your UX experience doesn't make them feel like the data is being refreshed and they're constantly hitting refresh and there's you know, round trips going back to servers all the time, that user behavior can perhaps undermine some of your efficiency improvements. Um, thinking about the kind of region, you know, the cloud availability zone, carbon intensity, that sort of stuff's got a low hanging fruit. Um, thinking about the intensity of the workloads as well. Would it make sense to move from infrastructure as a service to platform as a service. What we need there is data. You know, we need to better understand what is the CO2 intensity of one cloud service versus another. And some cloud providers are better than others. GCP is certainly leading the way on some of this stuff. I have to say our AWS is unfortunately somewhat lagging in, in many of the indicators. A classic example of that is AWS uh, carbon data is three months out of date. So you're waiting three months to find out what your carbon emissions were. And the, the, so um, whereas yeah, GCP is uh, near real time, 
got a lot of um, transparency about how it calculates things. Uh, there's a great paper actually out there on the, the different cloud providers and how ethical they are and, um, and how transparent they are around carbon. This is the other side of the coin. This is how you know how can tech support sustainable um, objectives. So very cheap slide here, which essentially all the sustainable development goals can be underpinned by a number of different digital technologies. I've called out a few here, I'm not saying it's exhaustive. There's a big thing for me around using data platforms for measurement, reporting and tracking and compliance. Um, that could be things like you know, ESG reporting, uh, TCFD is total uh, climate financial, financial disclosures, that sort of stuff that's really interesting in the sort of energy, uh, sorry, financial trading markets. Visualization and mapping tools can be really powerful. I've got a quick example in a minute of one of those. Community action, collaboration is a really interesting one. I had a great conversation with a lady from Friends of the Earth a few, a few weeks ago about how we can use digital technology to kind of use the power of the crowd and local communities to, to, to change their behaviours and do things differently. Traceability and transparency is a big one for me. How do, we, how do we really understand what's going on in the supply chain, but perhaps not use a blockchain solution which uses lots of energy <laughs> to tra track and trace the, uh, the, the supply chain because have you just undermined uh, the transparency by, by creating a whole load of carbon in, in the platform that's actually then creating the traceability and the transparency. And then there's a, an interesting thing I think around sort of smart sensors, internet of things and edge computing. I think there's some really interesting innovations that may well happen there which will allow us to do things. So the sustainable development goals have some sort of trackers around greenhouse gas emissions for example per country so some really interesting sort of examples of that. Um, this one's really interesting for me. A number of, this is an electricity map. This is an open source project, but there's also a commercial business that runs on top of this. And essentially what they've done is they've gone out and found the different uh, national um, electricity fuel grid mix uh, data sources. And then in real time, they then allow you to see what the different carbon intensity is of the different regions. Um, maybe it's a bit gimmicky, I don't know, but I actually think the API that sits behind this might actually be really, really useful. And there are already carbon aware software development kits and things that are making advantage of some of this data that's now available about how intensive, uh, you know, how carbon intensive different electricity sources are in different countries. So, a, a, an interesting um, you know, example. It's quite graphical, quite visual. But equally, you could you could look at you know, mapping air quality, you could look at ma mapping inequality, education. You know, a whole, whole bunch of different things there, which I think is really important. And then finally, this one's possibly a little bit gimmicky. The tree planting bit per search definitely is. But what perhaps isn't is started to kind of show people's. Um, uh, climate pledges and so on when you search for a brand or when you search for a product. I, I really think creating cons uh, conscientious consumers, so consumers that can think about different dimensions than just the price of something, is really, really important. Now don't get me wrong, big industries have got a big part to play as well, individual choice only plays a small part, but actually if at the moment, how do we know if we're making a, a sustainable choice? It's really, really difficult. It's a lot of marketing. What we really need is this hard data, I think, on how well is this brand performing or how well is this product you know, how long does it last, typically. There's a whole bunch of other metrics other than cost, um, and perhaps also other than just CO2 that need to be available to consumers to make smart choices. So, with that, I have now done my talking. Apologies, it was perhaps a bit, bit longer than I, than I found. I'm a bit confused to ask about this topic, as you probably can gather. So Silas is gonna hit stop. So I promised this slide, but didn't actually talk to it. So this is the other OpenAI um, example I wanted to give, which is asking ChatGPT the question, how and when is human civilization likely to collapse? And the fact uh, here is that it talks about finding sustainable solutions to the problems we face at the end of the response, and I just thought it was rather appropriate and apt given uh, the topic of the of the talk. And this was the first response I got back from, from ChatGPT. So yeah, look, I hope you enjoyed the talk, uh, either of those of you who attended and then are watching this back as a recording. All those of you that are watching this just as the recording, if this is of interest to you, please do get in touch with me. I'm really looking to collaborate with people on this topic. As you can tell, I'm really passionate about it. I really want us to move forward in an open source way um, so that we can all kind of come together and, and, and look at ways to solve this. So Architect Tomorrow is definitely gonna be focusing a lot on this topic in 2023. So please do reach out to me if this is of interest to you. Thank you.